It's my pleasure to introduce uh, professor, my colleagues, uh, Professor Silvia Naif, who is full professor at the University of Geneva, and she is the co-director with me of the master's program on contemporary art of the Arab world, Iran, and Turkey, that is being offered by the University of Venice in cooperation with the University of Geneva. Um, she has been um, one of the first European academics to embark uh, for her PhD in, in a research on the modern art of Iraq already in the 1990s. Perhaps she has been the first one in Europe, we'll check one day. And since then, she has conducted research and published widely on the subject of modern art in the years. And she has also devoted her efforts to the formation of the new generation of scholars on this subject, supervising a number of PhD theses, and of course, uh, BA and master thesis. Um, she's one of the founding members of Manazi, that you perhaps know, uh, which is the Swiss platform for the study of visual art, architecture, and heritage in the MENA region, as well as the Manazi Journal. And today she will deliver an introductory lecture to the study of contemporary art of the Arab world, uh, Iran and Turkey, that will clarify, we hope, why it is important to look at this very broad horizon from a specific perspective and well equipped with the right kind of tools. I leave the microphone to you, Silvia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, for this kind introduction. So, and hello again to everybody. So, I, why choosing a master's degree on art from the Arab world, Iran, and Turkey? Why not just studying art history? Some academic programs in this field include today non-Western art in their curriculum. So, is there any point about specializing in the art of this specific area? These are questions that you might be asking yourself and that Christina Tongini and I asked ourselves before starting to build up the program. I will try to give an answer to these questions, taking three specific examples from different periods in the 19th and 20th century, focusing on three dates. Art history has its landmark dates. If we think of modern art, in the Western context, we might mention, among others, 1865, when Edouard Manet exhibited his Olympia at the Parisian Salon, creating a scandal. Or 1907, when Pablo Picasso, with his Demoiselle d'Avignon, introduced the first elements of what was going to be Cubism and the reference to the African masks. Or 1917, when Marcel Duchamp took a urinal and exhibited it as a ready-made, shaking even further the concept of art sublimity, becoming thus the precursor of contemporary art. But what do these dates mean when we go from Europe and North America to the MENA region? Are they significant in this context? Before I try to give an answer to this, I would like to explain the geographical boundaries of this masterclass and of our program. Why limiting the area to the Arab world, Iran and Turkey? This is again a relevant question and it could be argued that there is no real coherence in this choice. Of course, any delimitation has its limit and has a part of arbitrary. However, the concept of MENA region, as we defined it, including the Arab world, Iran, and Turkey, is quite common in various disciplines. And in our opinion, it makes also sense in art history. Why? Because in this whole area, we can observe concomitant developments in the context of the modernization process, which starts in the 19th century. In the wake of this all encompassing trend, art practice undergoes in the Arab world, in Turkey and Iran, a tremendous change. Art in its Western modality is adopted all over the region in the main urban centers, 
and eventually replaces almost entirely formal local practices of art production that we usually define by the term of Islamic art. I'm not going to define the term here. There is a break and a new techniques and ways of conceiving art are adopted between the late 19th and the early 20th century. A second shift can be observed when attempts at creating local modernism start in Turkey as early as the 1920s and 30s, in the 1940s and 1950s in Iran and the Arab world. And finally, with the globalization of the international art scene since the 1990s, Contemporary art has become the most widespread mode of artistic expression in the region, as it has on a global scale. But let's come back to the landmark dates. The first date is 1888. And a painting by Osman Hamdi, the Persian carpet dealer on the street. Osman Hamdi was the first Ottoman professional painter. He studied in Paris at the Beaux-Arts with the Orientalist painters Gustave Boulanger and Jean-Léon Gérard. He then came back to Istanbul where painting in the Western manner already was practiced at the military academy and became Hamdi in 1883, the founder and first director of the Fine Arts Academy. This institution was the first of its kind in the region. It was followed by the Fine Arts School in Cairo in 1908 and the Fine Arts School in Tehran, 1911. They all taught art in its Western modality, a totally new language and concept in this region. If we look at the painting painted in an Orientalist manner, we would, coming from a training in Western art, definitely range it in, within the Orientalist genre. At the first glance, the painting has a striking similarity with Jerome's The Carpet Merchant in Cairo, which you see here on the left, painted just one year earlier. The same topic, the same accuracy in rendering the details of Oriental arabesque decoration on buildings and carpets. As Adam Eldam wrote in 2012, Osman Hamdi deploys a whole grammar of Orientalism. So, could we say that this is a form of auto-Orientalism, of self-Orientalizing? And second point, if we think that Impressionism had already started to challenge the ways of representation and to break with the strict academic rules Orientalism was still following, it is a somehow, is it a somehow old fashioned painting? A second look will tell us another story. For the first point, while Jerome illustrates, and, and I put it in quotation marks, eternal and unchangeable Orient, with no historical anchorage, as the hieratic positions of the characters here, if you look at the painting, illustrate, um, Osman Hamdi gives quite another perspective. His picture shows a contemporary scene. Why? We see an Oriental merchant who encounters a Western family with their dragoman, their translator. Thus, although totally Orientalist by its style, I think we cannot take another position towards this, um, Hamdi's representation is not that of an Orient that has not changed since times immemorial, as the Orientalist view used to illustrate it. And as you have it in Jerome's painting, there is no sign of the contemporary era in it. It seems therefore difficult to name it auto-Orientalist. For the second point, it is true 
that its pictorial language, uh, in its pictorial language, Osman Hamdi's painting could seem old fashioned and conventional. However, if we put it in its own context in, of what modernity and avant-garde meant at that time in the Ottoman Empire, the painting is intrinsically modern. Why? Because it marks a complete break with existing represent representational traditions and introduces definitely a new way of seeing. The same can be said of the works of art produced in other parts of the region in the late 19th and the first half of the 20th century, which were symptomatic of new cultural practices. As Kirsten Scheib has shown in her seminal 2010 article with the title Necessary Nudes, Havata and Muasara in the Lives of Modern Lebanese, Nudes, a very conventional practice by then in Western art and education, became to signify modernity per se in the Lebanese context of the 1930s and 1940s. Our second date will be 1957, and the chosen painting is Baghdadiyat, or Two Women, by the Iraqi Jawad Selim. Now, if you look at these paintings, the parallels to Picasso's Girl with Mirror are obvious. Are we facing here what Parta Mitter in 2008 critically defined as the Picasso Manquet syndrome? Again, this might be our first impression. However, if we go deeper into Iraq's artistic and intellectual history, we will see that Jawad Salim's work is much more than a Picasso manquet. In 1951, Jawad Salim and other Iraqi modernist artists got gathered together in the Baghdad Group for Modern Art. The group published a manifesto in which it expressed what path Iraqi modern art should follow in order to find its place within the international context. Two figures were highlighted by this manifesto. Yahya Wasiti, a 13th century miniaturist from the city of Wasit in central Iraq, known for his manuscript of the Mahmaqamad, you see it here on the left. And the other artist was Pablo Picasso, who, as the manifesto pointed out, had been able to become the major modern artist by coming back to early Andalusian art it means art of his country, and then to African art. Thus, this should be the two pillars of modern Iraqi art. The strong tie with its representational history incarnated by al -Wasiti, whose role it was to legitimize the practice of painting itself in Iraq, and on the other side, modernism, based on Picasso's lessons, meaning that Iraqi artists should produce a modern art inspired by the numerous artistic traditions of the country. If we get this, we understand and we look at Jawad Salim's painting very different. Let's come to our third date, which is 1971. This is the date of the painting that you see of Hossein Zenderudi, which belongs to the collection of the Centre Pompidou in Paris. Zenderudi was a member of the Sakakhane group in Iran, whose members referred to symbols and signs of popular culture in order to give a local imprint to their resolutely modern composition. So you see, there is something which the Baghdad group also had as, a, as aim. Starting from the late 1950s, the script, the Arabic script, became an important component in the work, in the works of artists of this group and of many others. And the Iranian art history speaks of Nakhashi Khat, calligraphic painting. The same year, 1971, in Baghdad, a group of Iraqi artists gathered around Shakir Hassan al-Said 
and exhibited their works in a group exhibition with the title Al Bord Al Wahed, translated generally into English with uh, the, the one dimension. Al Said had been earlier on a member of the Baghdad Group for Modern Art and was in quest of an artistic practice that would combine Iraqiness and modernity. He was well read in Sufi thought and formulated in his contemplative manifesto a few years earlier, an art historical reading grounded in Sufi language. With the one dimension, Honufia, the fact of using the Arab letters in uh, an artistic work, a trend that was going back to the 1940s, received its first theoretical base. The Arabic letter, this is the term used in the manifesto, would allow Iraqi and Arab artists to produce an abstract art which was rooted in their culture. The manifesto also clearly expressed that the exhibitors were artists in the modern sense and not calligraphers. Now, even in Turkey, where the Latin alphabet replaced in 1928 the Arabic one, artists as Errol Akiyabash used Arabic letters in their compositions. So it is a trend that you can find all over the region that we will study in our master's program. Now, artworks using Arabic writing, and I'm saying writing and not calligraphy, which all aim at conceiving and producing a form of abstract art rooted in the region's artistic traditions, but that is completely distinct from Islamic calligraphy. All these artists were not trained generally in Islamic calligraphy. Uh, and Islamic calligraphy, which also had its own rules and concepts, are most of the time interpreted as Islamic calligraphy and as an expression of an uninterrupted tradition going back to the first centuries of Islam and continuing up to our days. Again, such interpretations clearly based on a lack of specific knowledge of the region's art history, do not take into account the artist's purpose, meaning their intention to produce modern art and are based on the idea of an Islamic civilization that did not change and evolve since its inception. They do not take into account the important break that took place between the 19th and 20th century all around the region with the introduction of art in its Western modality, which was then adapted to local considerations as these examples show. Now, such judgments are still widespread and they take the Western art historical chronology and interpretation as the unit of measurement. I would rather like to adopt here Sultan al Qasim's notion of imperfect chronology when he says, and I quote him, you have it also here on the PowerPoint, it is essential not to measure them, and he means the Arab art movements, but we can extend it to movements in Iran or Turkey, according to a Western art historical timeline, end of quote. These movements have to be measured in their own right, in their own context. This is what our master's program aims at offering you, the keys to understanding art and art history in the MENA region, through the study of its artists, of its art movements, but also through the lens of a staff of experts in the art of the region. And I hand now the mic over to Christina, who will give you more details about our master's degree. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. And I will now proceed to share my screen with you. Give me a moment.
aeroplane. Now, this uh, second part of um, our talk today will more specifically concern the, uh, this master program that we were talking about. I'm sorry, I just slipped. And I will share with you some of the considerations that brought um, Professor Naif and myself to develop such a program. I think you have understood quite well, although this was an introductory uh, lecture, that you need a specific knowledge to understand the works of art that come from the MENA regions. You need to look at it from a specific perspective and you need to understand the context they developed in. Now, let me just draw your attention on certain elements. Um, first of all, the extraordinary dynamism of the art scene in the Arab world, Iran and Turkey, that led in the last couple of decades to the opening of new museums, foundations, institutions, gallery exhibitions and fairs, you, you, you name them. And let me show you just couple of examples like the Mathaf, uh, which opened in 2010, and it's located in, in uh, Doha, it's the Arab Museum of Modern Art of Doha, uh, designed by a famous uh, French architect, Baudin, or again, the Louvre, Abu Dhabi, many European institutions opened kind of a, a local branch in the MENA region, Louvre Abu Dhabi, uh, opened in 2017 and is designed by uh, Jean Nouvel, or uh, all museums that reopened with the new, I'm sorry, I don't know what I did, or um, all museums that reopened with the new mission, like the Musée Sursoc uh, in Beirut that was already open in 1961. It's located in a, in a historical building of uh, Beirut and, and reopened in 2015 with an orientation toward uh, modern and contemporary art of uh, the area, but not only museum, but also um, biennials um, were established like the, the Istanbul Biennial that started in um, 1987 or the Sharjah Biennial, Sharjah is in the uh, United Arab Air, um, Emirate that opened in 2005 or Dubai Art Fair. Dubai Art Fair has really become the, um, I'm sorry, I seem to have a problem with my screen, um, is, has become one of the most important scenes for the art of the MENA regions and it takes place annually since the year 2007 and many galleries worldwide participate in this event or um, Tehran Art Fair that was established just in 2000, only more recently, but it is becoming one of the point of reference of um, the art of the Arab world, Iran and Turkey in, in the area. Now, it's not only a question of having new institutions in the area of older institutions in the area that are opening up to the modern art and to the contemporary art, but also very important museums and galleries worldwide, we can say, started to collect and exhibit art from the MENA regions. One of them, we can certainly count Tate Modern uh, of London as one of those, um, since a long time, Tate Modern has been uh, started to, to, to collect works of art from this part of the world and, ex and started to exhibit them. And one is certainly, the, this, the one that you see here is certainly one of the most uh, renowned uh, works of art uh, uh, by a famous uh, Iraqi artist, uh, the Azawi, um, dedicated to the massacre of the famous Sabra and, and, Shat, and Shatila, Shatila. And here again, going back to what uh, Professor Naif was saying earlier on, um, you can see what is a kind of mark of the work of an Iranian artist, Parviz Tanaboli, that um, is known as 
each, uh, each is this, um, uh, it, it's realized as a sculpture and it is, um, um, it, it reproduce it and uh, a word, an Iranian word, hitch, that stands for nothing. And um, it has become, uh, as I was saying, the mark of this artist. He has been producing this hitch in many different ways, uh, in different uh, material, in different uh, sizes. And in 2005, as a, as a protest against the conditions of the prisoners that were held in Guantanamo by the Americans, he produced this work that is titled Hitch in a Cage. And this work was bought, was acquired by the British Museum and exhibited uh, there, where we see the same Hitch that this time is in a, in a cage or you know, one of the most uh, renowned institutions worldwide for modern and contemporary art, it is the MoMA in New York, um, um, count in its collection uh, several um, uh, works of art from the Arab world, Iran and Turkey. And here you have the image of an, an exhibition they organized to respond to the travel ban that had been recently introduced at the time. Um, and they, in which way they responded, they started to showcase artists from banned country. And here we go back to the artists already um, mentioned by um, Professor Naev, Charles Hossein Zenderudi of Iranian, an artist of Iranian origins. And we can see here on the right, um, uh, one of his work. So um, now let's have a look at the market. Um, specialists recognize that today, we are facing a globalized art market because of course the, the, the process of global, globalization has obviously invested also the art market. And what have you seen? We have seen that um, not only New York, London and Paris have remained the traditional networks for the art market, but other cities have acquired um, this uh, position. Among them, many of the um, um, cities that are located in the Middle East, in our area of, uh, of interest. Of, uh, interest. Why? Um, why here? Because in all these regions, um, ambitious and far-reaching cultural development projects have been initiated by the governments and have been matched and sustained by corporate and private capitals. Meaning that there have been in all these regions, including the MENA regions, major investment in um, in the art scene. And this, of course, had led to the creation of new institution, of new museum, and as invigorating the art market that, of course, it's another of the factors that in many ways aliment, feed the uh, world of the art. Um, very important auction houses at some point realized that the world of art was becoming globalized and that a new role uh, was being played by the products of art from the Arab world, Iran and Turkey and Christie's, for instance, in, in the, at some point opened a branch in Dubai. And this, of course, um, encouraged the, um, the local market, but also transform the market of these work, the works of art into something global. And of course, the, the audience that started to appreciate the products of this area of the world was, became much wider. And this also had an effect on the appreciation from the monetary point of view of these works of art that previously were the, the field of um, selected specialists. Um, here you see on your, on your right, a celebrated work of one of the most famous um, Egyptian artists, Mahmoud Said, um, that was sold for 
two and a half millions of dollars, quite unexpectedly, because as you can see here, it was estimated around 300,000 or 400,000. And obviously this enormous price it was sold at the end is an effect of all the elements that I've just uh, described and contributed enormously on the world appreciation of the works of art from this part of this part of the world. And Sotheby's as well opened a branch in, in Doha, the branch specialized on the contemporary um, um, Arab, Iranian and Turkish art. And same story. Um, this uh, this part of a of a, uh, of a series of works known as the icons of the nine was sold for one hundred dollars. Somebody has left the microphone on. Please turn it off. To the this speech. And um, here again, so we see that the art market has adapted itself to the new situation, has responded, and has contributed to the development of the products of this art. Now, let me draw your attention to this. Uh, this is something that you can find on the um, Sotheby's description of the Doha branch or the description of the art sales devoted to the art of the Arab world, Iran and Turkey. Um, they say that our international team comprises highly specialized experts in London and Jeddah, as well as representatives strategically positioned in Paris, Istanbul, Abu Dhabi and Cairo. Now, where these experts are being formed, we have, I think it's quite clear by now that to really um, become an expert capable of dealing with the works of art that come from this part of the world, you need a certain specialization. Your expertise in the global art or in the Western modern and contemporary art is probably not enough. So why are these experts being formed? And with Professor Naif, we realized that academia has not really um, replied promptly to this new uh, request. So that's why we set up to create this master program known as MASCIDE, master's program on the contemporary art of the Arab world, Iran and, and Turkey, um, which is a program that tries to respond to the request for skilled professionals that are being made by the various institutions, both at a regional level and at the global level, as we have seen. So the aim of this um, must, uh, must guide, in short, is to provide a formation on the contemporary art of the Arab world, Iran and Turkey. And it has been conceived as a full-time international one year master's degree program on um, the subject, the contemporary art of the Arab world, Iran and, and, and Turkey. And the students through this master will um, learn uh, how to, to, to study, to evaluate, to collect, to display, to exhibit, and to write about visual arts from the Arab world, Iran, and Turkey. And let me just very briefly describe, introduce you to, the, to, to, to this course that is divided in two parts. The first part, uh, the first part that is theory and skills development, and the second part that is more practical. The first um, part consists in a series of lectures that are delivered uh, daily, but also in visits to museums, galleries, ateliers, fairs, and so on. And uh, um, they can also consist of practical and individual group work supervised by the tutor. Uh, this part um, will, um, will is articulated over a period of 19 weeks. And the lectures are divided into five models. So which 
one sub subject that are being taught. There are many, of course, the program is very articulated, but we can subdivide them into five different module. Global art, where students will learn about uh, Western art, uh, global art in general. Then the core of the course that is really concentrating, focusing on the modern and contemporary art of the Arab world, Iran and Turkey. And then a module on curatorship theory and practice, but of course, uh, tuned on the needs, on the specifications of the MENA region. Um, another module on art criticism and writing, and a final module on arts management. And at the end of this first part, there will be uh, um, a series of exams, of course. Um, lectures and workshops were led by renowned world-class scholars, curators and artists. We have been able to put together um, an extraordinary faculty that comes from you know, all over the world. And I must say our colleagues uh, and academics and, and curators have responded enthusiastically to our uh, call. Uh, why did we need to put together a faculty that comes from all over the world? Because it's, it's very difficult to find in a single academic institution all the specialized skills that such a master requires. So we have done it because what we are doing is that we gather in Venice some of the most renowned experts um, of the world on these, uh, on these topics. The second part, as I said, is, is practical and you, students will have an internship for six weeks that will be um, carried out at one of the partner institutions. And then a final part that consists in a thesis project to which the students will dedicate at least uh, five weeks and that this thesis will be presented and discussed in a final uh, presentation in the month of December that concludes this, um, this curriculum. The internship is organized by um, an institution that is quite known in Italy, it's Via Farini, that is a hub for modern and contemporary art that has been active since the 90s. They, um, they develop all sorts all sort of activities. They deal with education, consultancy, internship. Uh, they have uh, artists in residence. Um, they have a, a, a very important documentation services. And of course, they are in contact with all the major uh, organization, institutions, uh, and galleries um, in in Italy and, uh, and abroad, and they, will, they, they are in charge of organizing the internship for, um, for us. So at the end, the students will acquire the skills to start their career in various areas. They can develop the curatorial, the curatorial sector, depending also on their the thesis, um, the publishing sector, you know, they can start writing for media or for in the exhibition catalog, and the art promotion uh, sector that is one of the sectors that is being really majorly developed in this last, uh, last year. So this was really in short uh, a presentation of our mother master and of the ideas that took us there and of course if you need more information more practical information you can write to the challenge school that is in charge of the organization of the master and here you can see the um, the address um, with Professor Naif, we had um, decided, of course, we will leave some space for questions. So if you have a specific question, you can either, um, perhaps um, you can write in the, in the chat so we can read them aloud. And if they are of common interest, we can try to reply now, or if they are, as I said, of a more practical nature, you can write directly to the Challenge School. And thank you for your attention. If I can add something to what Christina said, 
This yeah. is a collaboration between Kafoskel and the University of Geneva, and the program includes also a week uh, where students will come to Geneva and have here an introduction to specific Swiss ways of philanthropy. And this will also be coupled with a trip to Paris, a very short trip to Paris, where we will visit a few institutions that work in the field of art from the Arab world, uh, Iran and Turkey. Thank you.